want, you're actually moving towards the last several churches. So anyway, let's, um, let's look at Smyrna. And the overview is persecution and apostasy from without. In Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things, says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. He goes on to say, I know your works, your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of what? Amen. Isn't that interesting that the devil has a church? That's what, that's what it says. The synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which are about you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. That's heavy. Wow. I was listening to a book on the way here today called The Meaning of Life. And it is a, um, I'm just going to say that he is a psychologist that was taken captive in World War II and spent three years in the prison camps. And he goes through all the psychological stuff that they went through who survived, who didn't survive, and tribulations, trials, facing death every day. Um, just riveting stuff. And yet I hear the same thing right here. Some of you will be thrown into prison, it says. Verse 11, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. The church of Smyrna represents the church under the pagan Roman persecution around the time of who? Diocletian. The third to fourth century. Here's the praise that God gives them. Christ offers eternal life to those who are faithful under persecution, even unto death. And you notice that there, there's no rebuke given to them. None at all. He goes on to say in the highlighted part of this verse that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. The church of Smyrna experienced intense persecution for 10 days using the day-for-year principle. This corresponds to the 10 years of Roman persecution. And that was from 303 to 313 A.D. The great persecution started in 303 and Diocletian ended with the Edict of Melon in A.D. 313, under the leadership of the new emperor, what's his name? Constantine the Great. This is interesting. So we find that this is a time period where there is persecution from without. Pergama, persecution and apostasy from within. There's a transition. There's a transition that takes place when Constantine goes to Constantinople and he leaves the throne in Rome to guess who? The papacy. She sits upon the throne of the Roman Empire, the deceased Roman Empire. In Revelation 2, 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. The church of Pergamos represents the church of the apostasy around the time of Constantine the Great, the 4th to 5th century. So you can see that each one of these churches, yes, related to a church. But you know there were more than seven churches at that time in Christianity. Did you know that? 
and that um, these letters were sent to these seven churches, but it went out to all the churches. It was for all Christianity. The messages were given to specific churches, but the messages transcend time. In fact, each one of these churches represent, again, time periods in history. This is the time of the 4th to 5th century. The praise. He praises the few, like Anthropos, who are faithful in the face of outright apostasy. Revelation 2.13. He says, I know your works and where you dwell. Where Satan's throne is. Well, this is some heavy stuff. One place it says the synagogue of Satan. Then it says it's the throne that, that uh, they've had to face the throne of Satan. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days which who? Was a faithful martyr who was killed among you. Where Satan dwells. Here's the rebuke. The apostasy of the Nicolaitans has caused a large number of Christians to practice immorality and to compromise with pagan idolatry. Okay? Now it goes on to say, but I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. How many of you remember reading about this in the Bible? Do you remember that? Verse 15. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. God is speaking. The meaning of the name of Anthropos, anti means against. Pus is the Greek root for father. The Latin equivalent, papas. The English is pope. Conclusion. Anthropos means against the Pope or against the papacy. In Pergama, the apostasy of the Nicolaitans wins the day. The movement of false apostles in the church of Ephesus is now enshrined in the power of the papacy and its claims to Peter's apostolic authority. Now, let's go back for just a moment and talk about apostolic authority. Because this is what the medieval church was based upon. This is what makes the church of Rome tick. In the sense that it rises or falls on apostolic authority. How does that work? Jesus commissioned Peter. They say that Peter commissioned other priests and ministers. And there's been a long line of apostolic succession. In other words, one group of elders would ordain another group and another group and another group. And it's been an unbroken chain throughout the centuries. All the way down to now. And they claim apostolic succession as their authority that connects them directly to Jesus and to Peter. And they say that the church is based upon or built upon Peter the rock, but Peter's name in the Greek is Pebble. It's not a rock. Now, when you think about that, if you can get people to believe that you have a direct link And that's why the priests have such power in their thinking. They can forgive sins. They can be mediators between God and man in their thinking. But we know that that's not biblical. So you begin to see the rise of this stuff in history. The corruption of Christianity shortly after the persecution of Diocletian in the 4th century. 
About this time, the organization of the church already showed the beginnings of a regular hierarchy. To be sure, the choice of spiritual leaders came more and more to be distinguished from laity as clergy. We as Protestants need to be careful. We do. You begin to see that in the early apostolic church, it was the priesthood of how many believers? All believers. All believers. This is basically somewhat, and I want to be careful when I say this, modeled, I'm going to, well, I'll just say it, apostate Israel. And the way that the priesthood had evolved into a racket. And the way they misused the religious services that pointed to Christ and so forth. The Church of Rome just simply took that model, brought it in to our times. And it's based under what you would consider an old covenant set up. So now we see that at the cross of Calvary, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent in the temple, Right? And there was a separation of that veil symbolizing that that system had come to an end. Earthly priest, the earthly priesthood had come to an end. So, what do we have now? We have a system that's based upon an old system. I say we, the Church of Rome. And we're beginning to see the roots of this during the time historically, of what we would consider Pergama. Distinctions arose among the bishops according to the position of their cities and with particular consideration for the apostolic foundation of certain congregations. The synods, which were convened for many various reasons, served to unite the bishops as a higher rank. Now this is just church history. Among the bishops themselves, serious degeneration becomes apparent as early as the third century. We find many of them sunk in worldly pomp as Roman officials, as merchants, even as users or usury. This is taken from the book, The Age of Constantine, pages 126 through 127. Under Constantine, Christianity and paganism emerged. A great inconsistency in Constantine's outward bearing persists. He accepts the monogram of Christ as the emblem of his army and has the name of Jupiter on his triumphal arch erased. But at the same time, he retains the old gods on his coins especially the sun god, as his unconquerable companion, and on important occasions his outward conduct is entirely pagan. You understand that Constantine was the first Roman emperor to truly embrace Christianity in the sense that he saw that his predecessors were constantly trying to kill off the Christians. The more he killed, the more they killed, the more they grew. Their blood was like seed. So Constantine said, hey, I'm just going to unite the two. Let's just have one big happy family. So that's what he endeavored to do. And um, in fact, he said that he was shown in a dream that he was to baptize his soldiers. He ran them through a river and uh, said, you're all now baptized. And Said you are to conquer in the in the in the sign of the cross. He wished to give direct guarantees to both religions, Christianity, paganism, and he was so powerful enough to maintain a twofold position. This is again taken from the age of Constantine. Constantine found the clergy 
clergy already so suitably organized for power. He therefore gave the clergy every possible guarantee of favor, even as far as a sort of participation in rule, and in return the clergy were the most devoted agents for spreading his power. And completely ignored the fact that he still stood with one foot in paganism and that his hands were over and over again stained with blood. Again, the age of Constantine, page 306. So we find that there is that polluting of Christianity and the church at Rome had already been embracing paganistic ideas and uh, it was easy for them to take the day of the sun. In fact, the first Sunday law was in 321 by Constantine. Oops. In Revelation 2.16, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He goes on to say in verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name, written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Now the next church we want to look at is Thyatira. The church during the 1260 years. Now remember... Your lesson goes into greater detail. This is just kind of a primer to help us get a little grip on some of the history of what happened back then. In Revelation 2, 18, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Sounds like what Daniel saw in Daniel 10. The Church of Thyatira represents the apostate Roman Catholic Church of the Mid-Ages, from 538 to 1798, better known as the Dark Ages. Here's the praise. Christ recognizes the good work, the faith, and the love of those who must patiently endure. He says, I know your works, your love, service, faith, and your patience. And as far as your work... The last are more than the first. But he also rebukes them. Thyatira fostered and tolerates paganism as she refuses to repent. Let's notice Revelation 2 verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allowed that woman Jezebel. Now think about this for a second. Let's put it on pause. Was Jezebel living at this time period? So was he just using the name? Was John using the name Jezebel metaphorically? Okay. This is a principle, folks. Because when you get to Revelation chapter 11, you're going to see things like Egypt. You're going to have two witnesses. You'll be amazed at who the two witnesses are. It's not what's normally taught. He goes on to say, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, there's two other women mentioned in the book of Revelation, right? There's the woman in white of Revelation 12, and then there's the woman in Revelation what? 17. Remember, she commits adultery. She, she entices the kings of the earth to sip from her cup. And the inhabitants of the earth to sip from her cup. So just keep that in mind when we're looking at Jezebel. And I have given her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Verse 23, I will kill her children with death, 
And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your what? This is a heavy statement. Are we saved by works? Can you commit good deeds? Now think about that question. It's loaded. Are you capable of doing anything good? Maybe in the eyes of a man, but in the eyes of God. The Bible says that no one is good. No, not one. You see, the interesting thing is, is that man can look good on the outside and he can give big gifts. He can do this. He can do that. And as long as you can't search his motives and his mindset, you really don't know. God knows the motive behind the action. In my devotional time this morning, a text really, really hit me between the eyes. I've been studying through the book of Romans and, um, and the writings of Paul, his other epistles besides Romans. He uses the term renewing the mind. Think about that. Renewing the mind. How are we to be kept safe? By the renewing of the mind. How are we to, to develop godlike character? By renewing the mind through the Word. It always comes back to the daily devotional life with Christ. It really does. That's the bottom line in all of this. The first love, when you're in love with somebody, you spend time with them, right? right. It's only as you, the, the, the relationship begins to wane and people become disinterested and they think that the pastor's greener over here and, and the marriage relationship begins to fall apart because the communication has fallen apart. You know, when we first started off with looking at these churches... Lord said, return to your first love. Go back to where you started. I think every day, ladies and gentlemen, we should have the renewing of our mind through the Word of God every day. Do not let a day go by that you don't spend time with Christ. That's the key. Because it says right here, He searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. So, it's not so much what we say, it's what we do. And what we do is motivated by what we spend time with. Right? Amen. So in essence, we are known by our works. But we're not saved by our works. And if there's any good works, it comes through a grace-saved relationship with Jesus Christ by the renewing of our mind through the Word every day. And here's a key point. The paganism of Jezebel, the false prophetess, versus that of the church period represented by Thyatira, Jezebel is identified as a false prophetess, Revelation 2.20. You notice where it says, who calls herself a prophetess. In ancient Israel, Jezebel led God's people into paganism. How many of you remember reading that in the Bible? You see, these Old Testament stories have in time truth. I'd suggest that maybe tonight or tomorrow you look at uh, 1 Kings 16, 29 through 1 Kings 21 and 2 Kings 9. First Kings 16, 31, and it came to pass as though... It had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nadab. That he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethabel, king of the Sodomites. And he went and he served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image 
Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. You see the power, ladies, that you have? Jezebel has children who are connected with her sin. Oh, by the way, the woman in Revelation 17, does she have daughters? In Revelation 2.23, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. You see, the harlot Babylon has daughters, like we just mentioned a second ago. Revelation 17.5. And on her forehead was written a name, mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores, and of the earth's abominations. The sin of Jezebel wrought a famine with no rain for how long? Three and a half years. Who was the prophet that announced this? Do you remember? What was his name? Elijah. Elijah. Where did he camp out at? At the stream, right? And what fed him daily? A raven. A raven. That's right. A raven. When was he to move? When the brook dried up. Right? You can apply that in your own life. When, when, you, when you're struggling with, should I move? Should I stay? What should I do? Well, when the brook dries up, that tells you what direction you need to go. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. When the heaven was shut up, there are three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land Luke 4 25 the sin of the Roman Catholic Church brought no spiritual rain for 1260 years which is three and a half prophetic years you see the you, you see the parallels here in Revelation 11 3 and 6 and that's coming by the way Revelation chapter 11 and I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for 1,260 days. We've heard that in Daniel, right? Yes. Wearing sackcloth, they have authority to shut the sky so that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. Now, who are these two witnesses? Well, you'll have to come on the night that we deal with Revelation 11 to figure that one out. But I can assure you it's not... Two prophets that are beamed down from the past wearing, wearing uh, rough clothing. <laughs> All right, we'll stop there. <laughs> Remember that the ancient Jewish calendar has a lunar calendar with 30 days per month. Three and a half years equal 42 months. Times 30 days, 1260 prophetic days equal 1260 years. From 538 to 1796 is the period of the papal supremacy, the time of darkness. It's basically based off of ancient Babylon, excuse me, ancient Israel, Jezebel, Ahab, the three and a half years of famine. It's just played out again in history. It's three and a half literal years, now it's three and a half prophetic years, which equal 1260 days, which equal day for a year, 1260 years. These are things that we've already talked about. Now to you I say, Revelation 2, 24, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. Never, ever move from a position that you hold biblically until you are convinced. And this is something I've learned in the 35 years of doing this kind of ministry. That there are a lot of people 
that hold to beliefs because their church holds to that belief. Whatever denomination, it doesn't matter. And the problem with that is that with the majority of people, and I can say within the context of the people that I have met, I have found that a large majority of people have never really studied what they believe. They've had a preacher tell them, mother, father, whatever. It's been a family tradition. It's been handed down. But very few people have ever taken their Bible and studied step by step by step exactly what they believe. And I'm not trying to be critical here, but I've had people in times past come to me and say, Now, Steve, you've mentioned from the Bible that Saturday is the Sabbath. I said, well, that's what the Bible says. Well, we believe that Sunday is that day. We believe that Sunday is the day of worship for the New Testament church. And here's what I do. I just simply say, I'm more than willing to sit down and have you give me a Bible study on why I should keep Sunday holy as a day of worship. And if you can give me the biblical evidence, I will stop speaking about the seventh-day Sabbath. Is that fair? I mean, if you're so sure, and I say you, I'm not, you know, I'm just talking. If you're so sure that you're right, then you should know every nook and cranny of what you are saying as far as your belief as to a day. I've had very few Bible studies on this. I've had people say, well, I just know that it is. I had a really nice man coming to a series of meetings over in Clements, over by Winston-Salem. He was coming every night. We talked about the Sabbath, and he said, you know, I see it from the Bible clearly. But i got to go check this out with my pastor. I wanted to say to him, go check it out in the Bible. But he goes to his pastor, and his pastor says, hey, Yeah, Saturday was the Sabbath, but we're under the new covenant, and Sunday is the day of worship now. Um, He didn't even have to prove it to him. He just said, "This this is what we believe. Guy comes back, looks at me, he says, we'll not be coming back to the meetings anymore. And I said, how come? He said, my preacher told me that Sunday is the day of worship. I said, well, I'm sure he gave you quite a bit of biblical evidence. And um, he said, no, I'm just going to take him the word of my preacher. Now, the man was innocent in that. And I think he really meant well. But that's not a safe place to be. On any subject, folks. If you belong to XYZ Church, you need to know why you go to XYZ Church. Not because it's convenient. Not because you like the choir. Not because you like the carpet. Not because you like this, that, or the other. It's because it is solid, biblical. And you know that you know in your heart. That's what we're talking about here. I may have told you this story before, but years ago, I was in Kansas City holding some lectures like this. And this older couple said, we want to invite you over to our house. So I go to their house. Unbeknownst to me, they had invited their pastor. And there was no malice there. And um, so the pastor's name was Michael, and he came in, and we started talking. And he said, now, you're teaching that, he brought this up. He said, you're teaching that Saturday is the Sabbath. I said, well, that's what the Bible teaches. And he kept after me a little bit, and I said, hey, pastor, Why don't you take your Bible right now and share with your church members right here at their kitchen table why they should keep a holy Sunday. Just do it. Take your Bible out and do it. Then he started looking at the Sabbath. 
And he said, well, the seventh day Sabbath, see what he was trying to do is get rid of the Sabbath to prove that Sunday is the day that takes its place. And he got rid of all the commandments, and then he restored nine of the commandments, and then I, I stopped him. And I said, Michael, if Sunday is a day of worship, he can stand on his own two legs. We don't need to do all this rigmarole and this dance and all of this stuff. Then he started attacking me personally. And I said, I understand a little bit about the art of debate. And I said, when a person cannot prove something, whether it's political or religious or whatever, they turn on the person that they're talking with and try to defer or, or you know, kind of change the subject matter. I said, you don't know me, and it's unchristian for you to start attacking me. And I said, Pastor, I want to ask you again, kindly, take your Bible. Show your church members that have a valid question about this subject. And he looked at me, and he said, you know I can't do it. He said, you're asking me to do something that I can't do. I know that Saturday's a Sabbath. That's what that man said at the kitchen table. I wanted to say, why don't you be honest about it at the very beginning? It's like the preacher that told me, Steve, I've got a radio ministry. I know what the Bible says, but if I follow it, I'll lose my congregation and I'll lose my finances. These are good men. They're sincere men. I've been talking with pastors of other denominations for years. They know this. I need to stop. <laughs> no, we're running out of time here. Let me just tie this off right here. And please, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to run pastors down of other churches. I'm not. And through the years, I have followed a principle. I will go to your pastor with you and sit down in his office and answer any questions you have about this subject matter. And he can ask his questions or answer questions. I've had pastors get sick, called out of town. Very rarely does it happen. Very rarely does it happen. The only reason I bring up the fourth commandment is because it's the one that says remember, and it seems like a lot of people are having a hard time remembering. Now, are we saved by keeping a commandment? No, we're saved by grace through faith that leads us into loving obedience to God's Word. Folks, we owe it to ourselves to know what we believe on every point. Just because we go to a church and it feels good, the music's good. At the end of the day, if I had to have, if I had to choose one thing from a church, one thing, solid, systematic Bible study. I enjoy music. I enjoy fellowship. I am a kinesthetic, so I, I am moved emotionally, deeply. But I'll never trade music for this. I tend to prefer the hymns myself because there's messages in those hymns. Now, I do like some of the newer songs. I do. The words, they, they make sense to me. But I question the rock and roll stuff that's been brought into the church. I question that. I really do. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I, I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I'm going to stop here at Sordas, post-Reformation church. This is the rise of the Reformation in church history. 
So at this time, you've got 45 minutes to work on your lesson together, okay? Have a little word of prayer at your tables and go ahead and get started.